85% of Vestair Collective users say that using our platform enables them to gradually distance themselves from fast fashion and shop less but better. BNP Paribas Personal Finance invites you to discover On The Way, the podcast that explores the path to responsible consumption. Whether entrepreneur, people from the world of business or researchers, On The Way gives a voice to those who day after day are helping to develop more sustainable consumption. Welcome, and I hope you enjoy listening. Hello, On The Way. I'm Hortense Provost, Impact Manager at Vestair Collective for just over two years now. I've always thought about what I could do with my career that would have meaning and make me want to get out of bed every morning. I started by taking medical school exams that I didn't pass. And so I went to study sociology in England. Then I came back to study political science in Paris. That's when I took my first classes on the environment. Before, I was more into the social and sociological side. That's when I came across Ashoka. We did an assignment, a collective student project for Ashoka, for a year. I met plenty of social entrepreneurs working with the social and solidarity economy. It really inspired me and gave me plenty of ideas. It was really fantastic. But after that, I still also wanted to see how the economy and the large corporations that we all know approach these challenges. CSR departments were just starting to emerge, and I went to Synergences, a sustainable development in CSR strategy consultancy, which then joined Deloitte. So I was in the Deloitte Sustainable Development Division as a non-specialist on the onset, doing CSR strategy for many large groups, lots of agri-food, finance, etc. And then at a certain point, my colleague and friend Clemence and I wanted to set up a division in sustainable fashion because this is what was missing among our clients. And we thought that this industry wasn't taking enough action and only just starting to become aware, which seems strange to us when the agri-food sector were much further ahead for example. So that was it. We went on a mission to meet lots of people in sustainable fashion in Paris. And then, one or two years later, I crossed paths with Dunia Wan, who was the chief impact office at Vestir Collective, who had just joined the firm and was looking for a right-hand person to build her strategy and put together the team. The Stair Collective was founded in 2009, so you have to imagine that in 2009, second-hand goods were not at all what they are now. It wasn't fashionable, especially in the world of fashion. It was something that people didn't talk about. It was considered cheap, and buying second-hand just wasn't done. At the time, there were only non-specialists in second-hand goods, such as eBay and Levon Coin. So the six co-founders, two of whom are still with us, and other co-directors, Sophie Hersant and Fanny Moisant, who had the intuition and who came especially for the aspect of fashion and luxury, modeling and fashion shows, who were really aware of the overwhelming waste of really magnificent items that were sometimes used for just a handful of seconds and then shut up in wardrobes. So the idea, the intuition, was already very impactful. It was to circulate and give a second and third life to clothes. And then there was also the intuition to take the opposite approach to very general marketplaces like Lebencoin and eBay and create a real fashion brand with a fashion DNA, with a clear editorial line to generate trust in this market. Because when you buy items for a thousand euros online or even 10,000 euros online, because we also sell our maize bags, etc., Obviously, the trust factor is very important. So to do so, they even invented a business from scratch, authentication, which is a little bit based on the role of experts who you find in auction houses. People who know by heart such and such designer in such and such year for such and such bag when there was such and such stitching, such and such lettering, and such and such fastening. It's really an exhilarating world. If you have the opportunity to come to Tourquois to visit the authentication center one day, it's absolutely wonderful. So there you go. And originally, it was called Vestère des Copines, meaning girlfriend's wardrobe, because there are very important community aspects that are still very important. But with the expansion abroad, the name changed to Vestère Collective. Mm-hmm. 
So today in 2022, Bastyr Collective is present in more than 80 countries. We have nearly 1,000 employees. When I arrived nearly two years ago, there were only 300 of us. So it's really partly a recent expansion. We're present on three continents, Europe, Asia, and the Americas in the broad sense. To give an idea of the scale, we have a little over 5 million items, a little over 125,000 new items posted online every day, and a community of over 20 million users, buyers, sellers, or both. The Vestir Collective community is mainly women, but not only. And also, the number of male users is growing a lot too. Our recent brand campaign introduces five characters. I don't know if you've seen the poster campaigns in the metro. Our five main Vestir user profiles are presented as puppets. We have Lady Green, of course, who is looking for more responsible consumption, who is typically both a buyer and a seller and is really fully committed to the circular economy. We have Rich, who is more of a seller, so who does this almost as a hobby, but also has a way to supplement his income. We have Hunter, who are vintage professionals, those who know by heart which designer in such and such year made such and such bag which is no longer made, and so they really are looking for unique items. We have Miss Classique, who are typically users who are looking for timeless classics that never go out of fashion. Beautiful items. The Burberry trench coat, to the Celine leather bag. And then drops, of course, because there's a whole section of users who are there for the accessibility. Because in secondhand goods, there's a drop in value that naturally applies to all the products, which enables us to find good deals and very beautiful items at slashed prices. The Vestere Collective brand has four pillars. Fashion, which we talked about a bit, of course. A desire to have a curated selection. And we have a team called Curation, which makes a selection at the entrance of the catalog. Then we have real brand campaigns. Vestere Collective is not a platform, a white label. It's a brand with an identity, editorial choices, and its own voice. And we have a trust pillar that we've also talked a bit about. It takes shape, comes to life, of course, and this authentication know-how that is not only, as you can imagine, in jewelry or rare items, but even for a Balenciaga trainer. There's counterfeiting, so you have to know how to authenticate. So in terms of ready-to-wear, sport, all the items above a certain sum, a thousand euros as it happens, there are true risks of counterfeiting. The users can choose to have their items authenticated. Only we don't require it below a thousand euros because we consider the risk to be minimal. A community pillar that we've also talked about a bit, which is very important. Making this functional economy, this sharing economy, come to life. And really have the impression that I'm going to buy a jumper from Dominique. And she can even tell me the item story when she sells it to me. So enabling buyers and sellers to interact with each other to create this community aspect. A community committed to a change in consumption. And the last pillar, of course, is the impact. It applies both to the brand's DNA and the observation we've already mentioned of closed waste, as well as the impact strategy we're putting in place. The impact is part of the Vestiary Collective's DNA, and at the same time, a little more than two years ago, when secondhand marketplaces were becoming widespread. Once again, Fanny and Sophie had the intuition that it was no longer enough to be a 100% circular company, that a quote-unquote proactive impact strategy was also needed. Therefore, we developed a strategy around four pillars once again. The first pillar, exemplarity, which very quickly took shape through B Corp certification, which is the most demanding CSR certification and really affects everyone in the company from governance to the environment. So the exemplarity pillar, which is very internal and focused on internal policies employees to awaken the activism in them. The second pillar on the impact measurement and improvement of our environmental and social footprint, in particular the climate strategy. The third pillar is around community. How we bring this topic to life in the user journey as well. How we reward and encourage these users who have chosen the circular economy and we encourage them to go even further in the circular economy. 
And in the last pillar of the ecosystem, we just tried two ecosystems, fashion and tech. In fashion, we really carry the voice of secondhand goods, the environmental benefits of secondhand goods. And in tech, more the voice of the position of women, because as a company whose idea began with two female co-founders, we have legitimacy, and it's a very important topic. In comparison to a traditional company, Vestair Collective, and actually like all 100% circular companies, such as Back Market, which you have also spoken to, we work on two aspects of impact measurement. The traditional aspect, like all companies, which is the measurement of our direct or indirect impact, and an additional aspect on a category we called avoid impacts. So to find and rationalize these environmental benefits of secondhand goods, we work with relatively standard methods to measure the environmental impact. Lifecycle analyzes where we work on the comparison between two scenarios. The scenario of buying new in shops versus the scenario of buying secondhand on Vestair Collective. The lifecycle analysis enables you to look at all the categories of environmental impact, so not just carbon, but water, biodiversity, etc. And that enables you to look at the whole life cycle of clothes, from producing the raw materials to the environmental costs, end of life cycle, and textile waste management. Management. Therefore, with these life cycle analyses that we've done on our main clothing categories, we realize that on average, the environmental benefit of buying on Vestair is tenfold. Or, to put it another way, it costs 10 times less to the environment, so the environmental cost is 90% lower when buying an item from Vestair Collective than buying new. So it's just huge. We have several ways of explaining this high rate. Of course, extending the life cycle of clothing item quote-unquote offsets the quote-unquote production impact over several years of life. We have a figure that has been proven, which says that when we extend a clothing item's life by just two years, it reduces its carbon-water impact by up to 70%. Therefore, it's really the principle of amortization over a longer period, because the environmental production cost of a clothing item is really huge. It's really an intensive industry. If we focus on carbon, which is our most material impact, because of course there's a lot of transportation, we're really a logistics platform. So we send products all over the world, and once again, we work on two aspects, on reducing our carbon intensity. Therefore, naturally, we will, for example, ensure that the algorithm always prioritizes local products. We replace air with road transport as much as we can and on all routes where it's possible. And then we have this avoided emissions scope. Based on the European Commission data on the impact of clothing production, its carbon climate impact, we know that despite the fact that there are still products on Vestair that are transported by plane, we generate half the emissions that we avoid. And a very important point, consumer studies. Because all of this is only true if we ensure that secondhand per purchases really replace and substitute new purchases, because obviously, if they come on top, there is no point. Because there is a benefit in buying secondhand, but we can't talk about avoided impacts. So we ask our customers to find out, think about your last purchase. Would you say that it enabled you to avoid buying new for a certain amount of time? Was it even one for one? Aren't you sure? Perhaps? And from that, we got a figure that was quite a pleasant surprise because it's higher than the figures that we got from third-party studies, and it was 70%. So, 70% of the purchase on Vestair Collective directly replaced first-hand purchases. And we think that that's really linked to our model and our choice of being high-end and also the communication and marketing that we have adopted, which is really to encourage users to invest. In fact, the fact that it's second-hand enables people to access higher quality products. That's something that we call the upscale effect of Vestair, which is that I've got a budget. If I have a budget of 50 euros a month, or 100 euros a month, or 200 euros a month for first-hand fashion, I'll perhaps be able to buy Zara. 
while in second hand, I can perhaps move to Isabel Morant or Celine, etc. And that really enables people to find higher quality items which last longer. And once again, linked to our consumer studies that we do with BCG in particular, we have another figure for this upscale effect, which is 85%. So 85% of Vestir Collective users say that using our platform enables them to gradually distance themselves from fast fashion and shop less but better, therefore to invest. The second-hand market is growing more quickly than the new market, and faster than fast fashion. So these are encouraging stats. But despite everything, looking at it head-on, this is still peanuts when we look at the overall purchase volumes. It's difficult to find the figures depending on whether it's in terms of volume or absolute, but let's say around 4% of sales, or in certain studies, for example, 50% of French people bought a second-hand item this last year. Well, that's cool, but it's not actually enough. When you look at the climate and environmental urgency we're facing, we really want this market to take off much faster, and we really want to help people move into second-hand, both in terms of buying and selling, getting their items to circulate, and for this, we take action on different levels. We have a lobbying part because we think that public authorities can play a very important role, for example, with tax incentives. We often talk about green VAT. It's true that there's no real reason to re-tax second-hand products that have already been taxed when sold firsthand. That would enable us to reduce our commission and continue with this momentum to make durable items accessible. Also, these tax incentives have really shown, as demonstrated with the automotive industry, for example, that this works. The automotive industry is nearly balanced between second-hand and buying new. But that's because it received huge amounts of subsidies and grants from public authorities. So the public authorities have a role to play. Then, naturally, I think, there's communication and marketing. For example, we really like back markets marketing. You are heroes in buying secondhand to make people realize and really draw inspiration from that and use our figures in communications, in our CRM, for example, to really encourage people and show them that their act of buying secondhand is not the same as a first-hand purchase. And then making the customer experience as seamless as possible so that it's easy to find what you're looking for with secondhand as with firsthand. And then the last aspect, I think, is also becoming aware of the main criticisms that are made with this booming second-hand market, which is, in a way, the rebound effect. In the end, don't we encourage overconsumption with this accessibility? So, is it actually less expensive to buy more? Or even worse, there's a second-hand market, so I don't actually need to think much about what I'm buying, because I can always sell it on? Several things. Firstly, it's one of the reasons for which we took the recent decision to really stop fast fashion, to leave this market behind, which in a way makes no sense in second hand, because the economic model. Because in the first hand economic model, you still need to explain how you can sell a t-shirt for 5 euros and pay the workers who made it. But in second hand goods, it's the same. We have a commission based model. There's no economic model for a 5 euro item. That's the first thing. But beyond that, a 5 5 euro item generally becomes deformed after one or two washes. It doesn't have the capacity to have a second or third life. And then this is not part of the approach we promote with our users at least of less but better. What we want is to really invest. Even in cotton t-shirts, you can invest in good cotton t-shirts that's well woven and will last over time. And also, in addition to being disastrous in terms of its production conditions, fast fashion is also disastrous in its end of life. I think that now everyone has become aware of this because there's an NGO called the Or Foundation that has done fantastic work to raise awareness of these issues. But our textile waste in Western countries is mainly sent to Africa. Well, Africa and also South America. Many developing countries would receive such quantities that it's completely unmanageable. They don't have the capacity or infrastructure to manage it all. And in any case, it's actually too much. Even if they could manage it, we really generate far too much textile waste. 
We really have a system of overproduction and overconsumption which is reaching phenomenal thresholds. So that's also what has obviously contributed to our decision to leave fast fashion behind. We don't want to take part in the system one way or another. And so if we continue to give an option to people to sell on fast fashion, we're continuing to encourage them to buy fast fashion. And that's not what we want. In my everyday life as a consumer, it's going to sound very corporate, but I really try to apply the trifecta, less, better, and secondhand. I really think that we have to make less. We don't have a choice. Also, I think that it can really be a pleasure to make less. I really believe in happy sobriety and minimalism. And I also think that on the other hand, you really have to be at peace and okay with the fact that we all have paradoxes, that sometimes pragmatism takes precedence and we can't be perfect in every aspect of our lives. I say that because I also became a mother recently and I realized that in terms of sustainable development, having a child is not always easy. And I also think that you shouldn't let eco-anxiety eat away at you. Obviously, it's good to be aware of these challenges, but it shouldn't paralyze us in every aspect of our daily lives. We must still have pleasure and frivolity above all in fashion. Fashion is also taking pleasure in what we wear and feeling good in our clothes. You can find all the episodes of On The Way on your favorite podcast platforms and on the personal-finance.pnpparibas website. Any links or references made by guests can be found in the introductory text of each episode. And if you'd like to take to our microphone and tell us your story, please contact nicolas.meunier at benpeparibas.com. See you very soon.